So it's really my pleasure today to introduce our keynote speaker. Um, but before I do that, I want to just uh, ask a question. So how many of you um, visit Dunkin' Donuts? Almost, well, we're in New England, right? That, that pink and orange and brown is everywhere. And how many of you know how McDonald's has been so successful, particularly in having so many Dunkin' Donuts? It's almost like there's one on every street corner, right? We don't have to go far to get a Dunkin' Donuts. Does anybody know why they've been so successful? Yeah, in the back there. Yeah. So part of it is like it's like in McDonald's is the same, right? They've 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 developed a sort of a brand and a logo that is very distinctive, and that we kind of we you know the minute we see it we go like oh yeah great I, I need a coffee right? Anybody any other thoughts about why they've been so successful and they have so many outlets around here? Yeah, franchising. franchising. Good, you get the prize. Excellent. Thanks so much. All right. So what is franchising? Franchising is is a system that. Companies like Dunkin' Donuts and McDonald's have used incredibly successfully. It's basically a business model that has allowed companies to expand without having to put their own uh, resources into that expansion. So in other words, they sell a franchise to an entrepreneur. It could be you, it could be your parents, it could be your uncles and aunts, right? They sell the opportunity to an entrepreneur in the community to basically operate a Dunkin' Donuts franchise. They give them, basically they sort of give them a business in a box, right? They, they give them the logo, they give them the, the coffee and the, and the donut products, they, and they tell them how to run that, they really help them learn how to run that business. It's been, an, it's been one of the most successful business models probably in the last 20 or 30 years. That's all really well and good, but what we care about uh, here at the Center for Social Innovation and Enterprise is really about how do we use some of those really effective business models to address some of the pressing social and environmental challenges in the world. So the United Nations set the Sustainable Development Goals a couple of years ago, and one of the biggest goals is around how do we reduce extreme poverty in the world? How do we reduce the number of people who live on less than $2 a day? So what's really exciting is that entrepreneurs like the one you're going to hear from today are starting to think about that question, right? In the past, we've really thought about charity, giving people who don't have very much sort of a handout. What our speaker today is going to talk about is how instead do we use the models of business to give those people a hand up. And what you're going to hear about is how using franchising sort of to, to create social change is really about two things. It's often about how do we get access for people in rural places, people living in poverty, how do we get them access to the kinds of goods and services that can really make their lives better, right? Because there aren't CVSs on every corner, there aren't star markets or shores on every, on every corner. And so they often don't have access to the kinds of goods and services that you and I take for granted that makes our lives good. But the other thing that franchising is doing in this world, in, in, this, in, this, in, this, in this realm, is that they're really helping to create employment, right? In many of the developing countries, there simply aren't the opportunities for employment that are going to help lift people out of poverty. And so franchising is also a vehicle to do that. So this is where our speaker, Beth Meadows, comes in. Um, Beth is the founder and CEO of Supply Hope, which is, as you'll hear, is creating access to healthy, uh, healthy food in Nicaragua. Beth has 25 years as an entrepreneur. She created one of the top travel organizations in the USA, which was franchised, um, and she really built a lot of skills during her career, including in franchising, but also in sales and marketing. And what I think is so impressive is that she's now using all of those skills and her resources to really make a difference in the lives of people in the developing world. So I'm going to hand over to Beth, and you're going to hear a lot more about how she's doing that. Thanks for being here, Beth. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Beth, and I'm the CEO and founder of Supply Hope. I thought I'd first start out my talk by talking about who my, who my favorite super, superhero is. Not Batman, not Superman, not Wonder Woman, but Rosa. Rosa was married at 16 
she had three kids by 20, and then her husband left her. To say those times were difficult would be an understatement. She tried to provide for her family by selling food to the neighbors, um, but it wasn't enough. Her children were starving, and she felt she had no other choice but to turn to sex work to put food on her table. She worked for nine years as a prostitute for men in Nicaragua, earning 50 cents. One constant thought in her mind was during that time was people say life is happy, but it's not. One day, Father Oscar, a man from House of Hope, an organization that helps women leave the sex industry, asked Rosa if she wanted help. Without hesitation, she boarded the, bu the bus and began her new life. Her desire was to change her life, but the question still remained, how will she feed her children? And that's where Supply Hope comes into the picture. Today, her story is continuing to unfold, and it's a story of empowerment and freedom instead of one filled with pain. R Rosa's Mercado Fresco is one of our top stores. She's always thinking of new ways on how to market her products in the neighborhood. She's on our leadership team, and she shares with the other oper operators what her top sales strategy is. And that strategy is simple, just be kind to people. Uh, we could all use that advice, I think. Um, some of the physical changes in the life of, of uh, Rosa is her home. She went from a tin home to home with real walls. Um, they have food on the table every day. And she's showing her children that they can take care of themselves through hard work. But you can't touch the changes in her life. Her heart is slowly healing from years of tragedy and a newfound sense of confidence and dignity. And that's why she's one of my superheroes. I can stand here today and I can tell you I'm honestly in my sweet spot. Uh, what better way to use my experience than to apply the same principles and strategies that made me successful to help people living in poverty. When I consider many of the social entrepreneurs that have been recognized over the past few years, I see young men and women with passion and leadership. But I can tell you I don't fit that mold. I'm not young. But I am using passion for my business and the lessons I've learned and the mistakes I've made into developing my vision of developing franchises. Just a little bit about me. Um, I grew up in a safe, middle-class suburb of Chicago and had a great childhood. Married my high school sweetheart, graduated from college and was a psychologist for about three years before I realized that that was not something I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Yes, my parents were not happy with me. At the same time, I found myself divorced and a single mom and a very uncertain time in my life. Um, thankfully, I was given the opportunity by a neighbor who was also an entrepreneur, and he gave me a loan, and I started my first business. To make a long story short, that business did well, and I used my profits to reinvest in other new businesses, and eventually I bought a travel agency. I turned that into a franchise and grew it to 265 locations nationwide before I sold that to American Express Division. Um, I have been blessed with business with a wonderful business career, and I think I'd be missing the whole part, a point if I wasn't doing what I'm doing now. I would like to inspire others at the end of their career or the beginning of their career to invest their experience wisely. Uh, we don't need to sit on the sidelines and watch the next generation do the work we should all be doing together to fight poverty and justice. I believe that every hardworking person should be given a path out of poverty and a chance to provide for their family regardless of where they're born. When I first went to Nicaragua, I was volunteering for an organization called Orphan Network. I'm crazy about kids and I love children. And so that afternoon, I was just playing with them, taking pictures with them, and holding them in my arms. And as we were leaving to go back to our hotel, the executive director, as we drove out of the orphanage, stopped because there was a lady on the side of the gate just sobbing hysterically. She had just left her two-year-old daughter, Jenny. She was bringing her there because she could not afford to take care of her because the daughter was sick and she was starving. And for me, that was just a, a pivotal point in my life. I mean, I laid awake that night thinking, how, how, can, how would I feel if I were Jenny's mother? I couldn't imagine what it would be like to, watch, to want to feed your child and not be able to do it, to give up your child to the care of others so that they could survive. 
Since day one, we've believed the way to end poverty for a family is to give them the opportunity to earn a reliable income. And having spent my life in franchising, I dreamed what it would be like to create opportunities for the poor to run their own business with the guidance and collaboration advantages that a franchise system provides. I started dreaming about what it would look like to see mothers providing not just food, but adequate shelter, education, and a better future for their children. I started dreaming of Supply Hope, an organization providing the opportunity for reliable income through micro franchises. Meet Jenny. She's smart, resourceful, and dedicated to providing a great life for her two daughters. And if she works hard and stays disciplined, she'll be able to do that over time. Well, not necessarily. Jenny lives in one of the poorest parts of Nicaragua. And no matter how hard she tries, hard work is not rewarded like it is in other parts of the world. Therefore, she's left with no path, no opportunity, and no hope. But we at Supply Hope give people like Jenny an opportunity, and this is how it works. Supply Hope develops a proven business that trains and equips individuals like Jenny, who were previously earning around $2 a day to run the business as operators. Jenny earns a steady portion of income on everything she sells, and the rest of the money supports what's needed to provide inventory, accounting, distribution, and training. But poverty is not only about not having money. So Supply Hope provides trained operators like Jenny with a variety of benefits and programs designed to help her and her family prosper. Pretty good deal, right? It's called micro-franchising, and we think it's pretty awesome. So far, we've launched over 50 micro-franchises in Nicaragua, and the incomes of operators have more than tripled. We're providing goods and services that benefit the people living in poverty, and we're making a long-lasting systemic impact on future generations. We're planning to have 250 micro-franchises up and running in the next year or so, but we need your help. Share our story, wear some swag, start a fundraiser, commit to a donation, or connect us with people who can help. Jenny and thousands of others like her deserve an opportunity. And with your help, hope can happen. So Supply Hope develops proven sustainable micro-franchise business. Supply Hope was founded in 2012 as a mission-driven experiment to see if franchising principles would work with people making less than $2 a day. Since its exception, we've experienced validation, confirmation, and momentum as we've seen the impact results so far. We recognize that addressing poverty, you must have sustainable solutions that build capacity and empower people to improve their own lives and futures. We believe micro is the way to make that happen. We also know that the success of any organization is the team behind it. And we have a team of 20 talented and passionate the Nicaraguans who are dedicated to the mission of Supply Hope. Many of them come from poverty themselves, and they see what they're doing as a way of uh, helping their country. I'm going to quickly walk you through our model so you can have a big picture understanding before we dive into the details. I will highlight what we've learned are uh, the advantages in the micro-franchise approach. First, Supply Hope de develops proven businesses that can be managed by micro-franchise operators who have little education. When you don't have a lot of money, you can't take a lot of risk. And owning a, a proven business is less risky than receiving microcredit to start your own business. So we believe strongly in co-creation, and we develop everything in partnership with our micro-franchises that are set up as test stores. We research and pilot until we have a proven and sustainable business. We negotiate with the, sub the suppliers so that we can take advantage of centralized purchasing for competitive pricing. An independent entrepreneur doesn't have the scale to negotiate like we can. We own our micro-franchise brands and provide marketing support to our micro-franchise operators. Our micro-franchise operators are admitted to our program after a screening process. We target people who are earning less than $2 a day, who want to work hard. Um, they receive all the training, equipment, and ongoing support necessary to operate their business successfully. 
What also makes our model different is that we provide our inventory on consignment. That means that the potential, operate, the potential of the operator is not limited to their access to credit or cash flow management skills, which are even hard for sophisticated businesses to do. A dedicated micro-franchise operator who is selling well and will, re will receive more inventory translating to higher earnings. Because we're managing our franchise like a business, our approach is sustainable. Micro-franchise operators are paid a commission on sales and the money left is paid uh, for the suppliers and the operation of the franchise. And most importantly, this model is highly scalable. So five years ago, we came to Nicaragua to test it out. We, imme we immediately made the decision we were going to focus our first micro-franchise on the low-income markets. And that means our micro-franchise would provide f goods and services to service other low-income markets. We thought food was the right place to start, since that's the number one expense that they spend their money on. And we discovered, but what we discovered as we rolled out our pilot was there was another need. As we did our research, we found layers and layers of middlemen raising the price for the basic food. Yes, food purchased by the poor can be more expensive than food purchased by people with money. And we found that the poorest communities only had chips and soda within walking distance of their home. And our first purchase coordinator can tell you times about when he was sick from the cheese that he had to test in the market before we found a reliable supplier. We found out that formaldehyde was commonly added to extend the shelf life of the cheese, and the cheese was made in unsanitary conditions. While the focus of our impact measures is to create reliable income for the micro-franchise operators, our impact also extends to low-income communities with better access to better quality food and products and services. Our first micro-franchise is Mercado Fresco. That makes quality affordable food accessible to low income communities since our stores are located in the home of our micro franchise store. Our products include cheese, dairy, vegetables, bread, eggs, and traditional foods such as rice and beans and naka tamales. In 2016, we doubled Mercado Fresco to 90 stores across Managua and Ciudad Sandino. By the end of 2017, we will be operating at 150 stores. We have established the foundation needed to develop other micro-franchises and expand throughout Latin America. Our micro-franchise systems and processes have been tested and documented, and we're tracking our metrics to make sure that we're making the most impact. As we scale to 250 stores in Managua by 2018, we will hit our goal of sustainable operations. We operate a distribution center in Managua and make our deliveries to all the stores to ensure quality and availability. As we grow, we're improving the efficiencies of all of our internal warehousing and distribution systems. Let me take you through how, it, how the process of bringing on a new micro-franchise store. Currently, we're collecting our applications through referral partners, um, NGOs, schools, or churches who recommend women to our program. Our criteria is women making less than $2 a day with children in their home under the age of 18 and the desire to work hard. We don't have a minimum education requirement because everything we do is designed simple enough for anyone to be successful. We explain our program to the referral partner. They hand out the applications to our candidates. And the referral partners help us find people who are ready to change their life and that are not afraid of work. In 2016, we processed 800 applications. While the process, when the press got a hold of what we were doing and the word got out, we were just flooded with applications and phone calls. And that is when we started thinking about <coughs> we need to look at another model. And that's where we came up with the Fresco Express model and developing the pilot for Fresco Express. After we receive the applications, the very first thing we do is we make sure that their home is on a current route. And then we invite them in for an interview. Our interviews are at the office with a psychologist and in their home. If they meet our criteria, we invite them to training and our 
tra initial training is two days in the office and one day in their home. During the classroom training, they receive training on product handling, training on reports, customer service, sales and marketing. At the home training, it's what we call our grand opening, and that's where we set them up. We, and during that day, we walk around the neighborhood with flyers, and we make sure that they know that the Mercado Fresco is just around the corner. We also take out and do ta tastings of our naka tamales and stuff, just to make sure that they know how good our quality our food is. This is the only, this is only the beginning of the training we give them. We believe strongly in ongoing training and each week they receive a visit from our support staff that train and, inter and, and encourage them. This team also manages the business of reviewing the inventory on consignment, placing the next order, and most importantly paying them their commission. They also check to make sure that they're being compliant with all of our operating procedures as a franchise. I can tell you hundreds of stories, but if you were to ask one of our store operators what they most like about owning a Mercado Fresco, it would probably be how they are learning to run their own business and how they have a steady income. If you were to ask a child of one of our store operators, they would say things like their mom is happier, um, they get to go to school, and they have food to eat. Everything that you've heard about so far is happening in Managua at our Micro Franchise Center. Our Micro Franchise Center is smart business. It's where we consolidate things like training, accounting, our warehouse, the logistics, the purchasing power. It's also where they walk through the doors to fill out applications or meet with our team and interview and, and, uh, and learn about which Micro Franchise best fits them. But now let me tell you about the heart of the Micro Franchise Center. Our social values are wrapped in everything that we do. We believe that poverty is not just about not having money and that that's why we're offering programs for our women that support them. Um, so at the, the Micro Franchise Center, they will also go there and that's where they will get insurance health screenings, legal services, marriage and family counseling, or where they will receive training on budgets, join savings clubs, and receive home improvement loans. This is where our operators meet and network with other franchisees, or where they were mentored by our volunteers from MBA programs around the world, and where they will have training classes on self-esteem, child rearing, domestic abuse, cooking classes, and dancing classes. We believe that the Micro Franchise Center makes business sense, but we also know it's what our operators need. We believe it will help build the foundation of strength for greater impact. Now that you understand what we're doing, we want to tell you about where we're going. The past few years we've grown steadily, and as, as we continue to grow and develop our business model and make sure that we have the right partnerships and management team to support our growth, we're very excited about the potential of Mercado Fresco Express. Since it is just an extension of Mercado Fresco, we are very uncomfortable with our budget assumptions and very excited about the locations we've identified that will reach low-income people as they travel to and from work and relax with their family in parks. We have hundreds of potential candidates waiting for the opportunity to operate an express. When we have 175 Mercado Fresco stores and 200 express locations, our cost of our operations will be covered by our profits on sales. And we could be on the path to doing that in 2018. We could have 425 families earning reliable income while they're supported through their journey from poverty. And this would be sustainable, meaning year after year, these families can count on the income to enable their children to flourish and become the generation that finally exits poverty. But this is only the beginning. Our ultimate goal is that we have multiple micro franchise centers that are managed throughout Latin America. The goal means that we will be helping tens of thousands of people earn a reliable income while millions of people have access to products and services at better prices and better quality. Since starting Supply Hope, we've reached many milestones, and, but the most encouraging milestone is that the store operators are now earning an average of $5 a day, with some earning up to $10 a day. All of our operators are women, and that 
and those are the ones that are most negatively impacted by poverty. These numbers are life-changing to the women we serve. It also allows their children to see their family work to meet their own needs and give them hope for a better future. We came to Nicaragua to test our theories through actions and we're excited to say that micro-franchising is working. We're using our business experience and building on what we know while we humbly listen and learn what we don't. We then discover and adapt and knowing that this is long-term work with lasting change, we must balance what we know and what we learn and we must listen and adapt constantly. We believe that micro-franchising is a business solution to fighting poverty. And I hope that you all come to Nicaragua and someday meet our future superheroes. Her name is Jenny. <laughs> we all know that no one accomplishes anything worthwhile alone. And we need to all come together. And the fact that you're in this room means that you've chosen to be part of the solution to global poverty. And I look forward to hearing your questions and seeing how maybe we can all work together to fight poverty and injustice. She asked me to ask you guys uh, one of my <laughs> biggest challenging questions, and there's so many, <laughs> I couldn't figure out which one to ask. So I thought, <laughs> I thought we would first just maybe see if you guys have any questions, and, and, and if not, then we'll start making you help us. I do for sure. All right. Um, the UNH t-shirt, yeah. Um, do you plan on scaling this to other parts of the globe outside of Nicaragua? You know, definitely throughout Latin Central America, for sure. Um, I think probably, well, I need this oh, yeah. um, I think probably instead, I think the smarter thing for me to do would be to partner with organizations that are in the grounds of Africa, Asia, just so um, I'm using my model, but their knowledge. So I think going other than uh, Latin America and Central America, I think um, it's the same culture, but I think when you go someplace else, I think we'll probably partner with organizations. Thank you. Eli. Um, do you like um, compete with local produce and local stores, or um, do you somehow incorporate those into your business model? Okay. So I'm just going to repeat the question so everyone can hear it. So it, the question was, do you, uh, do you somehow compete with local producers and, and retailers, or do you somehow not compete? So can I get a, a, a hands of how many people have actually gone to uh, Central America, Latin America, and saw the little pulperias on every corner? So a lot of you know there is so much competition there. And what we did, which we felt was really important from a, from a marketing standpoint or a business standpoint, is that we chose to be different. Meaning that we have vegetables, fruit, no Coke, no candy, no chips. 100% of the other pulperias is what they call them in, in Latin America, um, have those products. Um, it was a business decision and it's I would say it's one of my challenges because we have the women in our stores saying things like, well, we're not a real potpourri or we're not a real store because we don't have everything that the other ones have. And the clients don't understand how important nutrition is for their children. So to answer your question, we work with local or rural farmers and cut out the middleman. So we go out and pay good prices to the farmers so that they get better prices in the rural and, um, and, and bring, the, bring the products in. So we definitely compete with the other pulperias with all of the products that we have, but um, we have better prices because we cut out the middleman. Beth, can you just mention a little bit about how you work with companies like Unilever as well? Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Uh huh. So, I mean, as, as you guys grow in your careers, you're going to uh, land wherever you land. Um, but I hope that you realize how important it is to have strategic alliances. And you'll find that throughout your whole career, whether it's your first job or your last job, that want to develop alliances with people who are like-minded is, is, would be some advice that this old lady could give you. Um, and because of that, 
we reached out to organizations like Unilever and Cargill that act actually love the poor. And what I mean by that is, so when we first started, we started with only cheese. And it's not the cheese like you guys would see here, wrapped up in chunks or sliced cheese. We gave them a big, big, big chunk. I think it was five pounds, I think it was, with a scale. and a, Because how that market bought is they could only afford one slice of cheese and one egg. That's how they fed themselves. Then they'd go out and, and come back if they made enough money for, to eat that at dinner. So we've always been conscious to have products that are affordable for the market that we're targeting. Unilever does that. So their soap packets are little, or shampoo packets and conditioner packets are little packets so that they can pay, you know, three cents for it and um, afford to buy it instead of a, a bottle that might be three dollars. And so that's part of why we reached out to Unilever knowing that that was so important to them. What we didn't expect, I wasn't asking for any favors, I just wanted their products at a good price. They came in and they gave us Walmart prices for our little stores. And it's just been a godsend, it really has. They, um, they, the margins, it allows us to have a higher margin, it allows us to pay more commission. It was just a really, really good um, partnership. Cargill, because we are focusing on nutrition and they know the challenges of, of reprogramming the brains of the people um, in that $2 and less, the bottom of the pyramid, they call it, or base of the pyramid, um, they, they came to us because they wanted to, they have a really strong nutrition uh, corporate social responsibility. And so we're working with them. We're actually buying, I think, lunch meat, sausages, and chicken from them. But they also are developing a, a personalized training program to help us get the nutrition um, word out and how to, how to teach the mothers that it's more important to give them egg for breakfast instead of a, a candy sucker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Beth. Yeah, and the blue shirt. Yeah. Uh, do you think micro franchising has a future in like higher possible areas, like, like an urban environment, like in New York City? So the question is, uh, does, does Beth think that that micro franchising model has uh, potential to work in higher income areas and urban areas like New York City? So it's a good question. So we are in urban in um, Managua, and um, we I have not looked at what it would mean to do rural yet. Uh, ultimately, if I, I, that's one of our projects on the interns that are coming in to have them investigate for us. I did have someone from Kellogg um, ask if they could do it in Chicago. And I'm supposed to be meeting with them in the next week to see if it's feasible. It, it, I believe it is. Um, there are some like that. Um, I'm not sure if it would be, what, I don't know what the, the profit would be on that because I've never done anything like this in the States. But I think it's feasible. Good question. Rachel. Uh, I'm curious about your sustainability. Um, when you're talking about becoming fully sustainable, is it just the stores or the services that you're providing for your franchisees as well? Or is Supply Hope continuing to provide that through donations? Is it something that they pay for when they go in? It's a, so that's I, just, I just need to repeat the question for the video, but uh, the question is already about what are you uh, hoping to do in terms of sustainability in, in a financial sense? Is it for your organization? Is it for the micro franchisees? So, um, very good question. Um, if you would have asked me that two years ago, I wouldn't have had the answer, but I do now. And so, what what we have developed is the franchise center model, and the reason why we have to go to 250 stores is because we want to be sustainable for the whole operation, not just the Mercado Fresco. Of course, as we add multiple franchises, and we're looking at a health clinic with a pharmacy, kind of like the CVS Minute Clinic, or Walgreens Minute Clinic, one of the two of them, um, and a, a hardware store. They do not have access to tools at all. So the you should see some of the brooms that they use and stuff like that. So I think those are the two other micro franchises that we are working on investigating. So it would be the whole micro franchise center for Managua. 
So Beth, um, maybe maybe because um, this is, this is sort of complicated a little bit. So maybe sort of break it down for students to sort of talk about uh, how your what Supply Hope is incorporated as as an organisation, mm -hmm. and sort of clarify you know sort of the difference between for profit and non profit, and sort of what your goal is and what your goal is for your franchisees. Right, and and I, I shared a little bit about my story because it, it truly when I watched that mom, it was a pivotal mo a moment for me, and. I came into the mindset of I need to start a nonprofit. I need to help these women with business. And um, so our organization became a, a, a nonprofit, both a US nonprofit and a US branch in Nicaragua. Lately, because of the sustainability mark and where we're heading, um, some of our mentors and, and, and board feel that it might be better off to move it into a corporation, a for-profit corporation. Well, I've pushed back and we're now evaluating whether it will be best to become a cooperative. So a cooperative would be all of the women uh, and store operators would own the well, own it, and so that's where I want to go uh, with it. And as long as the laws in Nicaragua, which change weekly, it feels like, um, um, allow us, that's our plan. And um, tell us just a little. Fine to interview you, but because <laughs> I think this is important. So tell us a little bit why why you feel so strongly that you didn't want it to be a for profit corporation, and why you want to have it be a cooperative and have it be owned by the women. Why is that so important? Well, I mean. First of all, strong opinion, any NGO should be run like a business. <laughs> That's a, I mean, let me say that. Even though it's an NGO, it should be run like a business. The reason I, I, um, I did not want profit to be the main focus. Um, mine was more about the social and helping and meeting the needs. That's why I've chosen for our target market to be the, by far the most difficult market to work with. Um, it is our, one of our number one challenges is how to take somebody who has a third grade education and husbands that beat them have been a, a part of incest. I mean, I can go on and on about the challenges that they have in that market um, and, and to empower them to believe they deserve it and that they can do it and to give them that. And so that's really kind of where where my heart is and where my focus is, but at the same time, my brain and business says we can't. If you, if you don't run it like a business, you won't be around. So, that's kind of why. That's fantastic. Thank you, Beth. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Thank you. And um, just wanted to say hi to my students who are here for I four one. Please remember to sign in outside on the way out. Um, I wanted to ask you a question. To that digs a little deeper into the, the business model sure. at the bottom line. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm just sort of wondering when um, a franchise, when a, when, when a partner um, signs on and receives training and supplies and um, I don't know, like aprons and all uh -huh. kinds of, you know, uh -huh. all, the, all, the, all the branding. Uh -huh. Yes. Are they, um, what are the terms on which those things are provided? Is it a credit term? Is mm -hmm. it a donation? Do they, so, so just to, do you want to just repeat the question? Um, so she's asking exactly what what is the the deal? What's what do they get and what do they sign? And um, there are a lot of organizations out there that um, don't run it like a franchise um, because I know and believe strongly in the franchise model. Um, we are running this like a franchise. So they come in, they sign a contract. The inventory, because we're doing it on consignment, they sign every time they get a delivery that they owe it or they, have, they give us the money or the product back, you one of the to, two. You maybe just explain what consignment is because it may not be okay. well understood. Okay. So on consignment is, is you pay as, as it's sold. So for example, um, initially our stores receive um, the equipment, the, the baskets, the signs and everything that you saw, the training. Um, and they get about $250 worth of products. Um, we have like a starter kit because we don't know how much they're going to sell. So the, the start, so what happens is at the grand opening, everything's set up, they're given these products, and two days later, our support staff goes back to them and actually um, 
finds they do an inventory to verify are they uh, selling more? Are they out of products? Do we need to fill them back up? And and that's how we continue to help them grow. We're constantly managing their inventory with them, but mostly us, but with them um, on helping them increase their sales. We have some stores that now have 800, their deliveries are $800 worth of product because that's how much they can sell. So it helps them because they're not constrained by the whole um, working capital uh, for the business people here and, or, or the uh, credit worthiness. These, these operators do not have credit um, and, and are not credit uh, worthy. So, so I think what you're saying is you, you don't, they don't have to buy that inventory ahead of time. They mm -hmm. only have to pay you for it once they sell, sell it. it. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Uh, question in the back of the lady in the plaid shirt. Yeah. You spoke of cutting out middlemen. Mm -hmm. I see some resentment growing among the said middlemen. Now, given that these shops are in people's homes, what are the security considerations? So just the question is about, uh, she's cutting out middlemen and uh, the middlemen resenting that and what are the, some of the security precautions given these stores are in women's homes? So obviously Latin America does have some issues with um, security and gangs and stuff like that. Nicaragua is the least of the, all of the Latin America countries. Um, in terms of the middleman, I don't know that they know it's Mercado Fresco because we go up with our truck and buy it and come down and it comes to our warehouse and then we, we send it out in the Mercado Fresco. So I'm not concerned about the security with actually Mercado Fresco name. Um, I, 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 we haven't had any problem yet. So yeah, yeah. so hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, yeah. Um, so you're talking about sustainability and a sense of business, but what about food-wise? Obviously, you're getting it directly from farmers, but what happens to leftover inventory? So the question is, what happens to leftover inventory? Mm -hmm. So um, one thing that w over the years have shifted, when I first started this, it was, I need to take care of these poor women. That was my mentality. I'm being bluntly honest. And I need to do everything for them. I need to deliver. I need to teach them. I need to tell them. I need to. And as I, as I, as I grew and got to know them, this was just an, a naive American businesswoman who's kind of a control freak. And um, so what happened is, in the beginning, it was, oh, if you don't sell it and it spoils, we'll just take it back. And we ate that. Um, not literally. Right, right. <laughs> not literally, yeah, exactly. Um, now, we tell them, you have certain guidelines for returning the products. And you have to accept them. You have to check them. You have to sell them. And it has become empowering. Uh, it's has, it wasn't a challenge at all. I could have probably started it from the beginning, but I didn't know because you know this is new to me. It's really easy running a you know a hundred million dollar company here in the United States, but. Well, not so, but you did it well. <laughs> Compared to what I'm doing in Nicaragua, for sure. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Um, you referring to we, like we doing the trainings, we go into the farms. I'm just wondering, like, who that is, is that Americans? Or no, it's 100% So Nicaraguan. the question is, who, who is we? Who's doing the training? Who's doing the organizing down there? The one thing that my mentors and board have helped me along this way is um, because of my personality and my type A, um, they were concerned that, that I would come in as an American company. And so I've been checked, if you know what I mean, constantly. And so all of our training, and we have um, 25, actually, Nicaraguan employees that do everything. And I really don't do anything other than encourage. Yeah, the staff, yeah. They are great. You guys would love them. There they are. There's the staff. <laughs> Other questions? Oh, there's one. Sorry, down there. Yes. Um, in terms of sustainability, do you see at one point, at some point, kind of supply of stepping away and it becoming a purely one mm -hmm. business? 
So the question is, um, do you at some point see Supply Hope being able to step away and really just allowing this to become a wholly Nicaraguan run owned business? Right. And so depending on the laws and how that will work, the ultimate goal would be that our, the micro franchise center that we're <laughs> developing um, will uh, allow them to stand on their own, and we're looking at other countries, El Salvador, and and so yes, I'm hoping by 2019 we'll be in another country, and Nicaragua. If I'm if I do my job right, I can leave and and not not have to worry about it. So. Yes. Um, I just have a question about your staff in this photo. So how um, did your organization go about finding these individuals? Is the same methods of training them, and are they compensated differently? Okay, so the question is around the staff in this photograph. How did you find them? How do you train them? How do you compensate them differently or the same to the people who are running the stores? Mm -hmm. I was very fortunate that our country director heard about what we were doing and wanted to come in from the beginning. And she is very connected in the nonprofit world. Um, we, they're all um, hired. They're all on salary. Um, we actually pay well compared to other um, companies and NGOs. Um, so um, that was an important part if, for me. Um, the store operators, our goal is that they'll make 200 to 300 dollars per month. So how can I set that goal without paying my own staff that? That is their, their minimum wage there is $120 a month is what their minimum wage is. And most corporations there, that's what they pay. So our staff is paid uh, $300 to $2,000 um, per month. So it's a lot different than the US, a lot different, but paid very well. And of course, their benefits are amazing. Good question. Oh, Anna, yeah. Just a, a side note from that. So are the Supply Hope employees considered U.S. employees or? No, Nicaraguan. Okay. Mm -hmm. So is, are the Supply Hope employees, are they American employees or Nicaraguan? But I'm mm -hmm. saying they're Nicaraguan employees. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Joanne. Just a question on the health benefits, or you were talking about the benefits of this group. Where does that translate to the home store owner? So, so the question is about the health benefits and how does it translate to the mm -hmm. store owner? Mm -hmm. we, they have um, uh, government insurance there and we as an organization pay for that for them. Our store operators, um, they currently have other benefits such as health screenings, um, life insurance, uh, uh, you know, uh, different different uh, insu uh, insurance type benefits or or network type benefits. The health part has not been solved yet. It's one of our challenges. Um, we're working now with a network of. Uh, health clinics to see if we can at least get it reduced down because there is a big difference between the government health and, and private. And I'm anxious to get our our next franchise because they'll go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. So, question. Um, There was a question that um, one of my students, Maddie uh, McGuire, submitted and she's just too shy to put her hand up so I'm going to ask the question <laughs> for her, um, which is how do you spread your message and get people to join? And then maybe you could also share a little bit about some of the things you shared with us earlier about sort of the psychological testing and, mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. do you make sure you're getting the right people yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. So obviously, um, although I was a horrible psychologist, let me just tell you, because I brought everyone's problems home with me, um, I believe strongly in psychology waved throughout business and life. So um, we may, part of the program... <coughs> In, in, this is my perfect world would be, and I've developed a test, it's actually a picture test, that when a operator comes in to fill out an application, they take this test and the test tells them which micro franchise that we have that would best fit their needs. Because let's face it, if you're a salesperson and, they t and, you, and, they, and, and you're told you have to do accounting, you're not going to be happy. If you're an accountant and you're told you have to go out and sell, you're just not going to be happy. So ultimately, our goal is to have micro-franchises that meet each of the people's skills and gifts. So
So part of doing that is we market, and that's what the Micro Franchise Center business part is, is that all of the applications will come in there, and they will actually go um, to, um, they will actually go through an application process and decide which um, business they, they want to, to, to own, and then begin that. Um, we market through NGOs, so uh, churches, um, schools. And what we do is we go in and we explain our program and we ask them to send us candidates that are really ready to work. Um, this is not charity. No one helped me uh, get my business. I worked hard. And so I do not, while I believe charity is necessary in emergency, my, my values is uh, you have to work hard, but you need an opportunity. So I saw us as an opportunity. I saw Supply Hope giving opportunities. So um, we do our marketing through the NGOs and the schools and the churches, but what happened is the, one of our stores outside the U.S. Embassy, um, the, the ambassador saw it. So she reached out to us and she wanted to do a photo TV thing at the, um, uh, at the store. Whoa, talk about a circus. I, had, I mean, I didn't expect it and it was major. And we received so many phone calls and so many applications just from that probably five minutes on TV. Another thing that happened to us is we went to a church and, you know, which was not uncommon. We'd go to church, we'd do the presentation. We had 283 applications come in in one day. So that's when we realized that we needed to figure, and knowing that we can only have about 250 micro franchises in Managua, because otherwise they'll start cannibalizing on each other. So <clears throat> we, in the neighborhoods, in the low income neighborhoods. So I, it was a problem, it was a challenge. It was like, well, what do we do? Uh, we have all of these applications and we only can have a certain amount of slots and we don't have the funding or the other franchises set up, so what do we do? So we just recently, and Monday we're la launching it, we're, uh, is the Fresco Express model. And that is a model where we're going to allow people to come and, and get a cart or a backpack and sell fresh juices or um, naka tamales or, or um, uh, leche agri and tortillas at different bus stops and parks. So we believe, of course it's a pilot, and part of a pilot is testing, but we believe that um, we will be able to probably help another 1,100 um, operators throughout Managua and the peri-urban areas um, with, with um, an earning an income. Wow, pretty inspiring. So um, let's give a huge round of applause to Beth.